Welcome to the Corlin Economics Report, a weekly look at financial and political topics relating to asset-based investing. Guests on this program pay no fees to appear, and guests and hosts disclose any equity interest in companies profiled. Now, the Corlin Economics Report. Hey, everyone. Welcome in to the weekend edition of the KE Report. On this weekend show, we're going to be focusing on the resource sector. We're going to start off with a focus more on the metals and precious metals area. Second half of the show, we're going to move over to the energy sector, really with a focus more on the equities here, because I know that's what most of you, our listeners, care about, looking down into the equities, seeing opportunities, and at least right now, we are seeing broadly stocks moving higher. It's a good environment out there for resource investors, but you do still need to be in the right stocks to capture at least the vast majority of these gains. I think we've all seen just how much the juniors have lagged, but they aren't at necessarily their lows that we have seen over the past couple years. To kick off this show, we are chatting with Joe Mazumdar, editor of Exploration Insights. I will post a link to Exploration Insights in the show notes. Joe, the gold, silver, they've been off to a pretty good start to kick off the second half of this year. Earlier this week, gold was closing in on 2500 Silver was above $31 an ounce. A little bit of volatility throughout the week, but overall, the stocks have done pretty well, but it has been led by some of the bigger stocks, which, hey, you can make the argument that's a sign of potentially an early or mid-stage bull market. Joe, you were just at a conference down in Boca Raton put on by our good friend Rick Rule. He used to hold this conference in Vancouver, now moved it to a a sunnier part of the world. Joe, what was your takeaway from the conference? What were some of the major themes you heard? Well, it was a good conference, and that conference is as much or more about the people attending than the companies that attend. And I mean, and I think that's what's attractive to the companies that go. It's not an inexpensive conference, given the location in Boca Raton and everything is not cheap there. But I mean, you get ex- the exposure to a lot of probably high net worth individuals that are actually keen on the sector, mostly I would say precious, but they do hear a lot from other critical minerals and companies. I'm not sure how many hundreds of people were there, but I, I think it was well attended. There's a lot of macro input into that that people enjoy and company presentations, breakout lunches and things like that. But yeah, I, I think my the rate the main reason I go there is for the attendees, the high net worth individuals that are keen on the mining industry. And from the feedback from the companies that have booths that they don't know who they're talking to and how big their so-called books are. But when they talk to the right individuals, they could see buying that day on higher than average volume. And so Back in the day, we used to see this, where you would go to a conference and you could see buying on the back of it. We don't see many conferences like that. Uh, The one, the Rick Rule Symposium, a natural resource symposium in Boca, is still one of those. Well, Joe, as far as the sector itself, when you're at a convention like that or at a show, uh, a lot of people, at least when we're talking with people, have still been a little upset that the juniors haven't been performing as well as they'd like, considering gold's been making all-time highs and silver broke above 30. But when you look at the mid-tiers and the majors, they actually have responded. To Corey's point, you know, the the sector has taken off in the producers first, which is normal. The question I have is, do you think with the higher metals prices for Q2, and it looks like it's setting up that way for Q3 as well, that generalists may start making more note, or maybe some analysts may start making note of the producers actually starting to make money at these prices? Yeah, I would say if we're talking just generalists. Uh, the generalist has to see the argument that, uh, you know, real rates are going to go down. And, and that's part of why we're, we're having this run in stocks, that they're showing some beta to the gold price. Because the gold price increase, some of it is coming from the idea that the U.S. Federal Reserve might have its first rate cut in this cycle coming in September. Like, remember, like when we started last year of this year, at the end of last year, the idea was that we would have six interest rate cuts by the U.S. Federal Reserve in 2024. And, you know, the stocks did well in the beginning of the year thinking like that, Um, you know, as 
So those cuts weren't coming. Equities didn't do so well, go up precious metal equities. But the gold price stayed up and actually went up even further because of central bank demand. Again, I think we've had this conversation before where central bank demand and purchases don't bleed over into equities. Whereas if it's institutional equity, generalists buying gold ETFs, that will spill over into major producers that offer dividends and to intermediate producers and eventually down the food chain to to the juniors and opening up a financing window potentially for non-cash flowing juniors. We haven't seen that which what was happening in the first part of this year or the latter part of last year until really more recently where we've seen the indications that inflation is coming down and unemployment is going up. So that might make the Federal Reserve cut rates in September. But problematically, we have the U.S. presidential elections coming in November, and there is some push there, political push, though there shouldn't be a political reason to cut or not cut not to have a rate cut before the actual election, which is in November. And so there, there is a bit of a uh, underlying theme there that might lead the U.S. Federal Reserve to potentially wait for a rate cut until the uh, actual election. But right now, there's definitely institutional equities coming in. There's gold going back up. Uh, and I'm sure now we've had ETF inflows now, and that's bleeding over into equities. Because the last couple of months, we haven't seen a lot of central bank buying by the Chinese. Joe, one thing we hear all the time about is that to get generalists into the market, we need a market correction, a market crash. I find it very interesting that over the past couple of years, as gold has went up about 50 percent, over 50 percent. It's actually followed pace with something like the S&P. That ratio is chopped around, but it's pretty much flat over the last couple of years. The underlying stocks, now they have gone up a bit more, so those have outperformed. Is there an environment here where if the markets do well, money naturally can come over to the precious metals and investors have that more risk on attitude? Or do you believe in the commentary that markets need to crash and that is what brings investors into the underlying gold stocks? Okay, so there's a few things to unpack there. So one is the uh, the gold price relationship with the S&P 500. And so a lot of the movement in the S&P 500 has also been rate related to the rate cuts because the valuation of stocks is still maybe archaically still related to net present value of projected free cash flow. And if you lower the discount rate, which is related to the risk-free rate, which would be the benchmark rates. If those go down, then theoretically the valuation stocks go up. So if real rates go down, that should be better for those companies that are trading on the S&P 500. At the same time, that's good for gold. What I've noticed that there's days when gold does really well, but the precious metal equity beta is not very good. And that's because the component of equities requires for the whole market to do well. And so you could have a bad day in the market, good day for gold price, but the precious metals equities are not performing that well because the entire market is is down. So sometimes like to get a really good beta, you need a combination of positive market sentiment as well as positive moves in gold at the same time for precious metals equities, especially the major ones to do well. Well, Joe, another thing that gets the animal spirits going in the sector is M&A. And we did, we have talked to you in the past about a lot of M&A deals that we were seeing, but we're still not seeing that big wave. You would think at $2,400, almost $2,500 gold and 30 plus silver that some of these companies would be in acquisition mode and start picking up either single asset producers or big development projects because they're more than economical now as far as all of the studies that have been done on these. Do you think that we'll see a bigger wave of M&A coming down the road, considering where metal prices are today? That's uh, probably uh, the hope of many. Uh, and it's definitely my hope. Uh, because the easiest thing to do is buy production. And that would increase your own production. You don't take the risk of permitting. You don't take the risk of capital acceleration, escalation. And you, the timelines as well. The production is right there. And that's we've seen that in the copper market. And we'll probably continue to see that in the gold market. What's encouraging 
as we have seen a project that makes sense, like a reunion goals, Oco West taken out by G mining, but unusually this wasn't a producing company. This was a company that was just on the verge of coming into first pour at their Tocantinsinho gold project in Brazil. And then they go out and acquire for paper Oco West. I mean, I think it was a good purchase. And I think the combination might be a, a future M&A takeout. So I'm sure that the people that own Reunion, a lot of them held their G mining converted shares. And I think that's probably a company that's growing in terms of production because Tokentinzinho will be in production. And these guys are really, you know, first rate developers. So they don't mind taking that development risk and that and they have a lower cost of capital because they're so good at what they do. And and that kind of jungle environment, they've done very well building projects for Newmont and Marion in Suriname, Fruta del Norte in Ecuador, uh, and other projects, and also Tocantinsinho, their own project in Brazil, and now this one, potentially Oco West in Guyana. But I'd, I'd like to see more of that. But I think there's probably still some reticence because of, especially if a project isn't permitted yet, and, and potential capital escalation. So they're forcing a lot of these development guys to be to have a lot more of their de-risking done whether it's a PFS, pre-feasibility study, or a feasibility study, questions about metallurgy, more questions probably about social license to operate and permitting to know that you can actually build it in a timeline you suspect. And so that's probably more of the reticence of, for M&A on the development space. So do you see any hope for exploration companies, those that maybe just have a resource or simply a PEA? to get taken over or is this still just a game where you either need to be built or so far down the road that those are the ones that are going to be still the targets over the next who knows couple years yeah i think with oco west they didn't have anything more than a scoping study but the thing is the company that was acquiring them was so confident in their own ability to decipher the numbers and come up with their own conclusion as opposed to using potentially that scoping study because they were comfortable building projects in that environment, they could come up with numbers that actually made sense to them. Not all companies could do that in their acquisition. Most corporate development, I won't say they're lazy because I did work in corporate development for Newmont. We did work hard, but most of the time you work hard and it's a negative outcome, meaning you don't make an M&A transaction, but you still work about the same level to get a negative result. So everybody, I can guarantee you, is looking at everything and already come to their conclusions. But I don't know how many projects that the gold price will change their conclusion. There might be a fatal flaw in some of these that they will never get acquired that we might not know, but the company, the companies know. The higher gold price, as we talked about before, might make some of their own projects more viable without the acquisition. But right now, as we know, the acquisition cost is not the issue. They're not expensive, these projects, these companies. The risk is and the cost is on the capital and on the and on the timeline in terms of permitting. You really have to be comfortable with that. And you got to be comfortable th- with the jurisdiction. So if you don't work in that jurisdiction, that's another hurdle you got to get over because then that's a standalone, but also a standalone in a new jurisdiction for you. The M&A uh, would probably happen more for projects near other people's facilities because we know it's hard to permit. So if you already got a permit, uh, permitted facility in tailings to acquire an asset nearby that you can feed into your plant as your own mine is dwindling with respect to resources or reserves, that's an easy acquisition without potentially doing a lot of work in terms of permitting social license operate or capital because they know they have a comparative advantage uh, of getting it. So, yeah, it's different for every project, I would say. And sometimes we've seen like companies with byproducts that have some kind of critical mineral have a little bit of an advantage. Like we saw that one for Perpetua, where I think it was the Export-Import Bank had cited a high-level letter of intent of potentially give them about $800 million out of, I don't know, their billion plus required upfront capital to build that project because of their antimony byproduct credit. 
So, you know, for some gold companies who have a, a critical mineral sort of bent to them with respect to the byproduct, you know, they might have a comparative advantage in terms of funding right now in, in, in this market as well. Well, Joe, you mentioned that before the call, we had a discussion about some of the majors and mid-tiers that bought projects in the past or have development projects in their pipeline that were not economical at lower prices that actually could start creeping into economical projects now at these higher metals prices. But you brought up a great point I'd love you to share with our audience about what happened with Newmont when they did that in the past and that it's not a, it, sometimes it's a zero sum gain. So, but I just wonder how that ties into M&A with all these companies that have reserves that were written down in the past as they bring them back on, could that be preventing them looking at new deals as well? Yeah, I don't think anybody's prevented from looking at new deals because that's the job of corporate development is to look at everything. And I'm sure at the upcoming Precious Metals Summit in September, there'll be a lot of tire kicking there. But in terms of what we discussed prior to the interview, is like I did this little work through Twitter. Sometimes I, you get good questions and somebody noted what happened to Newmont's gold reserves. And so a couple of years ago, Newmont had their reserves quoted, I think, at 1200 or 1250 And then they usually, with their reserve statement, show a sensitivity. Okay, if the gold price goes up by X, the reserves will be higher by Y. And then they show that $200, $300 per ounce higher and lower. And so when you look at that number, I believe for the reserve that they ended up upgrading from 1250 I think it was to 1400 in the old sensitivity, that would have added, I believe, about 10, 9, 10 million ounces uh, potentially to their reserves without apparently batting an eye. But when they actually did it, and I talked about this in this capital market short course I conduct with some friends of mine at the roundup in January, if it wasn't for the acquisition of Yanacocha from Buenaventura to up their proportion to 100% of that asset in Peru, their reserves would have been flat, even though they increased the gold price. One of the attendees there was from Newmont. And basically he said most of that was basically the costs had gone up so much that those were not reserves anymore that they thought back in the old several years ago when they did the sensitivity that they would be. So that's another thing we got to look for is this cost creep. And I think the biggest cost jump escalation was during COVID. That's hopefully moderating. And that's the hope for the next quarter of financials coming out to see if we see that margin actually expanding as opposed to shrinking with these guys. So if we see that combination of lower the trend for a lower real rate, institutional equity getting into gold and spilling over into gold equities, the fact that those gold equities would be seeing higher margins potentially with moderating costs, that would be really where the betas would, would really come back in to play. Yeah, look, we we should be seeing better margins. We should be seeing everything being better in terms of the balance sheet. But it was getting better just in the last few quarters anyway. Joe, one of the big problems, I think, with M&A is the fact that these majors, the ones with money, are in the driver's seat. A lot of these development plays still have that financing risk because there just isn't that much money to, I guess, build these things or, quite frankly, the market caps of these companies. When you look at the building costs compared to market caps, it's a head scratcher in terms of how these companies are going to fund it. But we did have a financing package announced a little while ago, but we haven't chatted with you about it. That's from Skeena Resources. They put together with Orion a, a mixture of products to finance that build. Does that entice or force the majors then to make a deal if they were going to make a deal rather than sitting on the sidelines? So if we take Skeena and compare it to a Pretium and Bruce Jack. So Pretium and Bruce Jack did exactly the same sort of blend. I mean, not exactly with respect to terms, because that was obviously a long time ago, but a mixed part of financing, part equity, part debt, part stream. And I'm not sure if there was an offtake. There, I believe there was an offtake on, on, on Bruce Jack. So that combination to fund their project development because of the Bruce Jack guys were building and they were builders and they thought they could bring this thing into production. Because at that time, because of the resource risk with Bruce Jack, nobody wanted to acquire it. But they proved that the asset could work at a higher throughput 
and lowering the expectations of annual gold production. They managed to change that higher cost debt uh, into something more reasonable. And then they also bought down the stream. And then they created a situation in terms of, of production success, steady state operations, good jurisdiction, good social license to operate with the First Nations there. I think it was a Tal Town that they were acquired by Newcrest. And Newcrest by that time had some synergy because at that time they owned Redcrest. So that all worked out perfectly, I believe, from a risky resource project. But they needed two or three years, probably three to four years, to prove to a major that it actually worked. And they changed their financing structure to not be so burdensome. And and because their cost of capital for a project in BC was easily over 16%. And that's not what you think about when you can everyone discounts these things at 5%. And why should a project in BC that's permitted have that big of a discount? And that was all resource risk. So if you look at Skeena, they, I think, have to do the same thing. They have to get into production, build it, and then prove that it works. The difference probably is in the deleterious elements in the Skeena. I mean, the Skeena is obviously a very high-grade open-pit gold project with silver. The issue would be the mercury, the antimony, whatever else they have in those in their deposit that they have to work on. That's a liability that potentially some companies don't want. You know, That's a risk that Bruce Jack didn't have. Yeah, we've talked to Walter about that before, and he said that they worked through a lot of those metallurgical studies and have shown that there is a pathway to dealing with those credits and debits in the metallurgy in a positive way. But we'll see how it goes. I guess the question is, we're highlighting Skeena because we haven't seen a lot of these deals, Joe. Why are there not more of these development companies when there's a couple dozen that have millions of ounces of gold in the ground? They've done their studies. Why are they not putting together capital stacks like this and trying to do the same thing? Do you think there's a bigger problem? Is it the cost of capital has gone up because of interest rates? Or is it that their market caps are just so low that they can't bring in enough equity? Why are there not more companies putting their hand up and saying, hey, we'd like to be next? Well, the problem is that you can't do 100% debt. Uh, You can't do uh, 100% stream. You have to go to the market. And the market for development plays, the way the retail sector is right now, the retail sector prefers the first entry point on your theoretical Lasan curve, which is more exploration. They don't want to take the risk on the development side. And that's been a historic relationship. And so for them, it's hard to get that equity part. And so what Skeena has done with that more debt package, what Pretium did was get around equity at this point, because the equity right now is fairly expensive in terms of for development place. And these guys obviously believe that they can build the project. Most companies, juniors, do not have the people to build a project. And so they just sit there. So unless they can build it themselves, show that they can build it, most of these M&As want them to get closer to the end game. Like I remember with Long Canyon, which was an open pit heap leach, high grade, great recovery in Nevada, not far from Elko. That deposit, they needed to do some de-risking as well. They secured water. They advanced permitting. They had social license with the local ranchers. Frontier divested their uranium assets. Frontier purchased AUX to consolidate the ownership of the project. So they made it clean which allowed a company like Newmont to take it out. I'm sure that acquisition took about a year to come to fruition. So there might be some acquisitions out there that people have been looking at, and that's just how long some of these companies take to act. Yeah, we've heard that. Hey, that hasn't been a change in the market. These companies can take a while. The larger they are, the slower they move. Joe, big picture for this market, how do you classify it? As we've said, the majors, the mid-tiers, those have started to move. The juniors still haven't moved, but gold is continuously hitting all-time highs, and silver has hit some multi-year highs, especially above that magical almost $30 an ounce level. Is this mid-cycle bull market? Just what are your thoughts on the stage of the market that we're in right now? For me, if we're just talking gold, It'll all be around, you know, the direction of real rates. And we have 
the economy or the economic indicators telling us that the U.S. Federal Reserve is primed to move with respect to cutting. Not at the pace we thought or people had predicted or projected at the end of last year for 2024, but still something happening. I mean, directionally, that's good for gold. And uh, if we get that movement, that'll be good for precious metals. And like I said, if it's protracted, that'll get all the way down to the juniors and open up a financing window, hopefully for people coming in January of next year. The problem is that, again, U.S. presidential election, there's been a lot of chaos and probably gold has also been supported on the back of temporary sort of safe haven asset demand on the back of the assassination attempt on one of the candidates. Uh, so all that uncertainty is probably also helping gold right now and bringing people in even without the real rate argument. And that could also convert into equities. But there's so much going on now, it's hard to predict a long-term trend right now. That, But I think your position with respect to the companies, to pick those companies with good balance sheets, good assets and jurisdictions you like, to start loading up on those. Because I think they're poised for, uh, for something major. Because in the end, even if the institutional equities aren't there, these guys will still be spewing out a lot of cash flow because in the end, they're looking at the gold price. So producers will do well. And I, I have, for that exposure and to mitigate any cost creep, I've gone more to junior cash flowing royalty companies. That's been my way of playing it. Interesting. Well, look, a, a lot is going in the favor of the precious metals right now and some of the stocks too, even from a technical charting basis. So right now is a, a good time for the sector, but it's always hard to project out multiple years as much as people try to do that and throw whatever numbers they want. At least we can say that there have been some gains in this sector. It's gone along with a lot of other areas also moving higher and money coming in. Who knows where it's coming from, but the fact of the matter is we have seen some money coming in and we have seen some better volume in GDX and GDXJ, especially on some up days. Joe, it's always great chatting with you. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to share your insights on this market. As I mentioned, I'll post a link to Exploration Insights in the show notes so you can learn more about what Joe's writing about on a regular basis. Joe, thank you very much for you taking some time on this weekend show. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Al Corlin's firm, A.B. Corlin & Associates Incorporated, provides consulting services to public companies on matters of regulatory compliance. To find out more, follow the link from www.kereport.com. The Corlin Economics Report will be back after this brief timeout. Welcome to the Corlin Economics Report, a weekly look at financial and political topics relating to asset-based investing. Guests on this program pay no fees to appear, and guests and hosts disclose any equity interest in companies profiled. Now, the Corlin Economics Report. All right, welcome back. Continuing to listen to the weekend edition of the KE Report. As promised, we're continuing to focus on resources, but now moving over to the energy sectors. We're chatting with Dan Steffens. President of the Energy Perspectus Group, Dan has sent us another two companies for us to evaluate, get his insights on. One that we're recycling from just a couple interviews ago back in May, but there's a catalyst that is right around the corner that we also touched on in that interview. But as we always do, we'll talk about the underlying oil, natural gas prices. As we're recording this, oil is a little bit above $80 a barrel. Natural gas, little over, let's say 215. Now, what we're going to do here, instead of analyzing some of the data that we've seen come in, we're going to look ahead to the U.S. election, not weigh in on the election, but talk about what could change if we see a change in leadership. If Trump does get elected, Dan, what could that mean for the energy sector in terms of future policy and in terms of what he did last time in office? 
I get questions all the time from our members and other people send me emails. What happens if Trump's elected? You know, and they hit, will he go drill baby drill and, and that'll drive down oil prices? Well, drill baby drill in the in the middle of the shale revolution, that's where it was. Uh, U.S. was in the middle of just starting the, the shale revolution during his first term. A lot of companies were grabbing up big acreage blocks in the Permian and, and the other shale plays, and they were drilling a lot of wells just to hold production. So that, that's why you had twice as many rigs drilling for oil during his first term as you have today. And then since then, you've had that the Wall Street gang investors I said, okay, you spent all this money. I want to start getting dividends. I don't want you to outspend your cash flow anymore. And they, I think they would get hammered. I think the, a lot of the public companies that I follow that are promary, promising stock buybacks, higher dividends year after year, they're going, they were, they are not going to go run out a bunch of rigs. And most of their tier one acreage is now held by production. So they have no lease expirations that they got to deal with. Now, the other, the thing that could impact it a little bit, and I really hope this does happen, he has said that the minute he gets elected, even before he's torn into office, that he will negotiate peace between Russia and Ukraine. And guys, we want that to happen. So come on, war, let's stop, you know, funding these stupid wars all over the place. And if he does, that may bring maybe 500,000 barrels. But remember, the sanctions against Russia were not really enforced. I mean, China and India are taking every drop of oil that Russia can get, and they're get, being able to buy it at a discount. And so there's really not a lot of Russian oil. And Ukraine has attacked some of their infrastructure with drones, so it's going to take time to get that up. But I think the big thing, and this is bullish for oil, the day Trump takes office, he will enforce the sanctions against Iran. He's going to come out in support of Israel. He's going to, I think he'll blockade. Iran, and they won't be able to load tankers and stuff. So I, that would take 2 million barrels per day off the market. Saudi Arabia and their friends in the Persian Gulf that are not friends with Iran, that are really hate Iran, they will be happy to make up that difference. But that will reduce OPEC's spare capacity to near zero. And when OPEC's capacity has been that low, and when it gets down to even under 2 million barrels a day of spare capacity, that is scary tight for the global oil market, and that will keep oil prices higher. But Trump is like, and I do think Trump is likely to refill the U.S. Uh, strategic petroleum reserve, but I don't think he's going to do it right away because it would possibly increase gasoline and hurt the economy. But I do think the failed assassination attempt to kill Trump on Saturday, last Saturday, probably reduced the chance that Joe Biden will drain the SPR because what will happen is the Trump campaign will then accuse him of putting his re-election over the national security because the SPR is a national security risk. It's like draining your saving account to buy votes. I mean, it's just not good. But anyway, and then and last but not least, really, Trump believes in the Green New Deal. He, or he believes the Green New Deal is terrible. I mean, he it's terrible. He will pull out of the Paris Climate Accord like he did last time. They will have a common sense energy program that includes all of the above. I mean, we're going to need wind, solar, nuclear, every possible form of energy to meet rising demand. And Trump will be extremely bullish for natural gas. And he'll tout it as the clean hydrocarbon, that he's going to be ramping up our exports to natural gas. So we more ability for countries to convert from coal-fired power plants to natural gas-fired power plants, which is the quickest way to reduce carbon emissions anyway. So he will put... You know, and then he will make fast track uh, pipelines, all this blockage of every pipeline that is ever proposed. That will come to an end, I think. And LNG export facilities. He'll also fast track approval of these LNG export facilities, which will support natural gas prices. And, and I do think there's a strong possibility that soon after he's sworn in, he will allow completion of the Keystone XL pipeline, which would be super bullish for the Western Canadian oil producers. So I, I just don't think he's going to, you know, the drill baby, drill baby fear is overblown. I just think that. I think the other things he's going to do are, are going to be bullish for oil prices. Well, Dan, there's a lot to think about there, but there's a lot of policy changes we could see, as you alluded to, with the pipelines, with the LNG terminals. We'll just have to see how things play out, but interesting to kind of war game that through and think about how this could change the oil sector. One last question is, how do you think he would interact with OPEC as, because Joe Biden hasn't had a stellar interaction with the Saudis, do you think the U.S. interacting with OPEC, how would that change? Well, Saudi Arabia clearly wants Trump to win, which is one reason why they extended their cuts beyond the election date. 
they're not going to do anything to help Joe Biden get gasoline prices down. Re- remember, Iran is their enemy. Iran has bombed Saudi Arabia before. They are they're they're the other religion, and they're just not going to do anything. So, and Saudi Arabia is the only one that has meaningful excess spare capacity. So, they need to be our friend. We are still dependent, or the world is still dependent on a steady supply of Saudi Arabian oil. So, yes, and I think he'll be able to make friends with them. <laughs> I know they want him to win. So. All right, Dan, before we move into the companies, one more question on Trump's policies. Uh, what sort of impact they could have on the Canadian energy sector? Any insights on that, please? Well, I think overall he's going to raise global oil prices, which will help Canada for sure. I mean, I think the first thing he does right after he takes office is he's going to re- uh, enforce the sanctions against Iran. So that should pr- push oil prices higher. Now, you know, investors fear his, you know, drill, baby, drill uh, slogan, you know, but we're a, the, the industry is much different than it was during his first term. Uh, you know, now we have a lot more, you know, high decline rate, horizontal wells. A lot of the tier one acreage has been drilled out. There's no, there's not anything outside of the Permian Basin that really has a lot of upside for production. So, uh, and, and I mean, the companies just are not going to outspend their cash flow. Uh, Wall Street wants dividends. They want stock buybacks. They want return of cash. But then, uh, uh, and also, I, th- I think he'll successfully negotiate a settlement to the war in Ukraine. So that should help global oil prices, too. But specifically for Canada, I think uh, the deal is... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't quickly approve completion of the Keystone XL pipeline. You know, the thing is like 80%, 90% complete, and uh, we could sure use that Canadian heavy oil down here on the Gulf Coast refineries. But, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. And then, you know, he'll approve more pipelines just in general, I think. He'll fast-track LNG exports, which should raise the natural gas price in the U.S., which – I know Canada is also building their own LNG export facility. So having access to more you know, global markets is going to help uh, Canadian and U.S. gas producers quite a bit. So, you know, I'm, I'm just I just think he's more bullish for the industry. Uh, yeah. You know, the drill baby drill thing might bring prices down a little bit. Solution to, you know, resolution of the war over there might bring a little bit more uh, Russian oil uh, to the market. But also, I think, you know, Saudi Arabia is uh, wants Trump to win, primarily because they hate Iran. <laughs> and as a result, I think they'll work closely with him to stabilize oil prices, which will help everybody. Could there also be an opportunity in the service companies then, if we do go down that, in a way, drill, baby, drill? Yeah, I think there will be. Uh, I'd also look at the midstream companies. I, there's a lot of high-quality cl- uh, midstream companies that are already paying really good dividends. So, you know, any more fast tracking of pipelines would really help. And, uh, you know, that's equipment and jobs and and everything. So it's good. But, yeah, I think I think an oil full services side and, and the drilling companies should do better, too. All right. Well, Dan, let's move on to some of the companies. Then you're very good at diving into these companies. You have a wide range of portfolios that you share with your subscribers over at the Energy Prospectus Group. You sent us over two stocks, one being Devon Energy, traded DVN. It's one of the largest companies in your Sweet 16 growth portfolio. Has a market cap of over $30 billion U.S. dollars. Just take us through that nuance here. The largest company in your Sweet 16 growth profile. So you still see growth, but it's also a large cap company. Balance that out for us. Yeah, well, I've been following them, Devon Energy, for plus 20 years. I actually interviewed with him about 25 years ago for a job when I was still in Tulsa. Uh, anyway, it's not the biggest. We do have EOG uh, in there. And actually, my price target for Devon, I got more upside in Devon than I do in EOG. And I'm very bullish on EOG also. But uh, Devon Energy uh, recently announced that they are closing a $5 billion deal, which is big. I mean, they're $30 billion market cap, but they're closing this $5 billion acquisition in in the Williston Basin. So they're buying a company are uh, and all their assets. It's Grayson Mill Energy acquisition. It's the deal is valued at five billion. Uh, it's expected to close in September. Everybody's go for it's going to be immediately accretive to all financial 
per share measures. So increased net income per share, increased free cash flow per share. It's it's the way it's structured because it's going to be 3.25 billion is going to be in cash and 1.75 billion is going to be in debt and common stock. So it doesn't it, it it keeps the balance sheet in balance, let's say, and actually makes it a little bit less leveraged this deal. So anyway, because they're adding so many more assets. So think about it, they're going to add five they're going to book five billion dollars of assets, and they're going to only book three point two five billion in debt or less cash. So it, it deleverages the balance sheet from that standpoint. Again, immediately accretive to everything, and the most accretive that helps shareholders is free cash flow and net asset value. Uh, it's 100,000 barrels per day of additional production, uh, and I think 55% of that is oil. It's going to give them, make them one of the biggest, if not the biggest, producer in the Williston Basin. And because of that scale, they'll be able to negotiate better drilling costs, better tubular prices, all their oil field services stuff. Prices will go down, and it adds a lot of running room. I'm I use that term running room. That's these are low risk, high return. Development drilling locations, they've estimated that they've got 500 additional horizontal development drilling locations and then also a bunch of refracts. And that's another thing you're going to hear from a lot of companies pretty soon, I think, is that they're going back and refracking wells that they drilled and completed like five or six years ago at the beginning of the shale boom. And they're able to relog those wells and then design more targeted frack jobs instead of fracking every 200 feet. They're going to hit the parts of the zone that have the more most natural fractures, and as a result of that, open up more access to the reserves in place. So I think it's a really good deal, but they call it transformative for their Woolworths and Basin business. Now, I, I just I like the timing of stuff like this. I think when a deal of this size is announced, you'll notice that the prices always sell off, like right after it's announced. Oh, my God, they're taking on all this debt. But they're also taking on some really good assets. And Devin has an outstanding M&A team. They know what they're buying, and they're able to buy quality assets and get them for a good price. So, I mean, you know, once you get up to the $5 billion price target range, you've weeded out a lot of small guys that couldn't afford anything close to the size. So. Anyway, but they've got a real good return of capital. They do. They pay a fixed plus variable dividend that over the last four quarters was 2.05, was $2.05. They paid out in cash dividends. Uh, when you look, that's looking backwards, it has a 4.25% yield. But going forward, I think those dividends are going to go up to $2.40 over the next four quarters. They actually have raised the fixed portion of the dividend to 22% per share, 22 cents per share per quarter. And their variable dividend is a pretty good percentage of their free cash flow. And because this deal is going to increase their free cash flow per share, that means the variable part of that dividend should be going up maybe even higher, probably higher than what my forecast is. But anyway, but, you know, Devin's one of the largest oil producers in the U.S. and it's a top quality company and it's trading at a deep discount to my valuation. So it's at 48 today and it's on July 15th rather. And it's my valuation is $63. So I think it's got a lot of upside. Well, Dan, just thinking about that, the way these companies are valued as they announce a acquisition or a merger, like you say, the company doing the acquiring usually has a sell-off because people say, oh, look at the dilution in either cash or shares to acquire it. But a lot of analysts don't really start thinking about what the combined pro forma value of the company is until maybe after a quarter or two comes in. So in your experience, and this is maybe applicable to the next company we're going to discuss, which is Crescent Energy, traded under the ticker CRGY. We've already referenced that in, in a prior interview, and we're going to revisit it today. Do you think that in both these cases and in really other M&A deals, that there's an opportunity for investors to position during the dust having not settled yet, before more analysts start covering the pro forma company. Yeah, and, and I think in, in, in Devin's case in particular, they are very clear they do not intend to lower their dividend. I see. I think a lot of people that invest in these stocks like Devin, they're investing for the dividend yield. So they make the assumption, oh my God, they announced a great big deal. They, anou- they, an- they announced that uh, additional shares are going to be issued and, and debt's going to be taken on. So they're probably going to have to cut the dividend. That's the fear, right? At, you know, the day they announce it. But then you got to get into the detail and you say, hey, this is an accretive deal. This is accretive on uh, to to free cash flow per share, which is how they calculate their dividend. 
So the, your dividend is going to go up, not down. And I think when that sinks in and the deal closes, then also a lot of the Wall Street gang, because it is hard when when a deal of this size is announced to do do the work to put together a pro forma forecast model like I do, it, it takes some days to do that. And they're, so their immediate reaction is they just put the stock on hold. They issue a hold thing, forecast, not a buy. They take their buy down, make it hold. Everybody freaks out, and then you get a little bit of sell-off. But but you just have to get into the deal detail and look at them. And I just know Devin. I, I know a bunch of people. When I worked for Hess, then we moved to Houston. A lot of our employees went to work for them, and they're quality people across the board. They're based in Oklahoma City, by the way. But, Dan, when analysts are looking at this, fine, they, they might think that things change with the dividend. You're saying that it, it won't even change. But what about that whole growth aspect? Is the market coming around more to this whole growth by acquisition? Yeah, the, I mean, they should. So these companies have to keep replacing their reserves. So they have to keep either drilling a lot more wells to create production and proven reserves, or they go out and buy them. And if you can buy them, the reason you have a high level of activity in M&A is because these guys that have money, that have big cash flow, have access to a lot of capital. And, they ha- and, and because of their size, they have access to debt at a lower interest rate. So they can do an acquisition, which is what's happened here with the Crescent Point, the next one we're going to talk about. By doing that acquisition, they're able to refinance because now the size of the company goes from a small cap to a mid cap to a large cap, and they have you know lower interest rates offered to them. And so they can refinance their balance sheet. And I don't know. I mean, I, I've personally made a lot of money on M&A deals that the Wall Street gang kind of runs away from at the very beginning. Fact of the matter is, Dan, growth is good for sectors, right? Sometimes we get too focused, especially in these older sectors, on paying back dividends. But growth is what draws in some of the more generalist investors, too. So big deals, I think, are always good to see in different sectors. Let's move over to the other company, the one that we did talk about back in May, Crescent Energy, traded CRGY. Crescent Energy announced it's acquiring Silver Boat Resources, SBOW. This is a $2.1 billion deal, something we talked about back in May. This merger is now expected to close July 31st. What do you think the market is missing about this deal? Well, I just think the fact that they're closing the deal so quickly, they've got all the government approval they need down here to close the deal. So that's passed. Both companies have announced that they're going to have shareholder votes on it on, I think, the 26th or 7th of July, and then close shortly thereafter. So I say it's going to close by July 31st. But sometimes if there's almost unanimous support for the deal from both companies, you're going to get a close in that same afternoon. So I think the minute it closes, that's going to draw a lot of attention. Then the Wall Street gang has to upgrade, has to, all of them have to update their models based on the pro forma guidance of what the new company is going to do. And it's a pretty big deal. And the thing is, these were two fairly off the radar screen deals, companies. So, But when you put them both together, it's kind of a merger of equals. But their production is going to be 250,000 BOE a day. So it's got a market cap, let's say, that's one-fifteenth of Devon. So their market cap is only like $2 billion. Crescent, Crescent Energy today, Devon's is... 30 billion. Well, Devin, obviously a much larger company with a lot of mystery masses too. Their total production after their deal closes is going to be 765,000 BOE per day. And about 50% of that's going to be oil. And Crescent's going to have 250. So Crescent trading at one fifteenth of the market cap has production one third of what Devin had. So if you just compare them on size, that gives you an idea of how much upside Crescent has if they can meet all their guidance uh, numbers and everything, which are really good. Now, well, I will is say, that fair to do? Let me jump in here, Dan. If yeah, you're no. just comparing it simply on size, not yeah. all barrels are created equal in That's terms true. of cost. So true. how yeah. can we compare these two? Yeah, well, it's definitely, you know, Crescent is a gassier company, which today is a bad thing, but a year from now could be a very good thing. So it doesn't have the liquids production that Devin has. That's absolutely a, a true statement. But but on a cash flow basis and everything, it looks pretty darn good. And it, and it does have a lot of running room. Now, this Crescent is a 
80% South Texas Eagleford play. Now, the Eagleford has got plenty of pipeline access. That's what makes it attractive to me. It's further south. It's uh, near the Gulf Coast. It has direct access to Corpus Christi, where Chenier has a big LNG export facility that's going to go that's going to go up in size 50%. They're adding a third train to their big facility in Corpus Christi. So, so there's going to be demand for their gas real close, and it has oil pipelines. It does not have the problem that the Permian Basin has, where they are pipeline constrained, especially for gas. I mean, the, the Permian. Some of the companies in the Permian have to pay people to take their gas. They're literally getting negative gas prices in the Permian. So you want companies out there to produce a lot of oil. But Crescent, I'll, I'll tell you what, what's got Silver Bowl on my list is this is three or four years ago. One of our members sent me kind of some headlines on this company and said, hey, you need to look at this thing. And they had a bunch of acreage out in Webb County where EOG had announced a world-class natural gas discovery in Webb County. And when I looked at it, Silverbow's assets were right there, right in that same area where this was. And, uh, you know, if a big deal to EOG, which is a $75 billion market cap company, is a really big deal to a company the size of Silverbow. And I hadn't had never heard of Crescent Energy at that point. Now, Crescent Energy has a big uh, venture capital firm. It's called KKR. That backs that company. So they got strong financial backing. They're definitely going to make this deal work. And another thing, Crescent Energy, what I like is they pay a nice dividend and they've already confirmed to the shareholders of, of Silver Bowl that they are going to continue to pay those dividends. And this is also a trade that I think there's really good timing on this because it's, let's say it's going to close July 31st. Silver Bowl uh, shareholders have the option to take 3.125 shares, that's 3.125, three and an eighth share of Crescent Energy for every share of Silver Boy that they have. Well, now, today, those shares are trading like in lockstep, but they also, Silver Boy shareholders, can take cash. They have the option to take $38 of cash. So Silver Boy, on July 15th, was closing just above that 38 threshold. So... That's your worst case scenario. If you're a Silver Bow shareholder, this your Silver Bow should not go below the cash option because this deal is now 99% sure going to close in just a couple of weeks. So do you move in and buy now because you have that safety of the underlying cash consideration? Yeah, the only thing is Silver Bow does not pay a dividend. So maybe you might miss one dividend by doing it that way. I don't know. You need to look at the timing. But and the dividend rate's like 4%, so it's a pretty decent dividend. And it, it looks like to me they're going to fund a stock buyback program and stuff right away. So, I mean, it's got a good return of uh, capital program for their shareholders. It's just something I, I really like. I, I, you should take a look at it. My valuation is about 50% higher than where it trades. And that, in fact, it's almost a double. Okay, CRGY is the symbol, CRGY, and it... Uh, traded on July 15th at 1250. My current valuation is $24. So I see almost 100% upside in the stock, and you're going to get a dividend. And if the real upside is going to be if gas prices do get over three or 350, then the numbers on this one really look good. And they also sell a lot of high value NGLs. So their production mix is 37.5 crude oil, 44% natural gas, and 18.5%. NGLs. And today, as of second quarter, revenues are going to be like 93% from liquid sales. So anything they can start getting any decent prices on their gas is going to really be a plus for this company. All right. One more question then. Any debt considerations that we need to be aware of with this merger? Well, it's if it's a stock for stock deal, I mean, Silver has got some debt because they bought Chesapeake's assets recently in the South Texas. And they got a, they got it for a good price. I mean, I like that deal all by itself. So yeah, there's some debt consideration, but I think one of the things they're going to do is they're going to be able to restructure the debt. And this that's where the relationship with KKR is so important. Yeah, it just if you're listeners, just Google KKR and you'll go to it and see this is a multi-billion dollar venture capital firm that's had a lot of success and they've got access to all the debt they want. 
months. And the company just combines production at 250 BOE per day, like 100,000 barrels of oil per day. This is a real company. This is a significant company in size. They're going to be the second highest producer in South Texas. So it's going to get a lot more coverage once the deal closes. Okay. Dan, it's always great chatting with you. Very enlightening and always entertaining when we have you on the show. I appreciate you taking time with us every month to cover some of the moves in the underlying oil and natural gas prices. We didn't do too much of that on this segment because there hasn't been much going on in price, but a couple of companies to highlight, which is always a favorite for our listeners. So Dan, thank you for your time this weekend, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this weekend show. Be sure to go back throughout the week. Check out our website, podcast, and YouTube channel to stay up to date with all our daily editorials. And as always, keep in touch with Chad and I through email. We'll be back with you all next week. I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. Al Corlin's firm, A.B. Corlin and Associates Incorporated, provides consulting services to public companies on matters of regulatory compliance. To find out more, follow the link from www.kereport.com. The Corlin Economics Report will be back after this brief timeout.